Nice. So, Brian Kersanis, thank you for being here from Intel. I gotta say, we actually got lucky on the timing of a lot of these things because there's a lot of news going on. Uh, we had <laughs> Randall in the middle of the news. Um, you have been in the middle of the news as well, but your industry has been in particular in the news. Um, so I have, I have a couple of questions because we want to get your take okay. real quick on a couple of things. Um, first, you saw the news on Monday, Broadcom uh. making a hostile bid for Qualcomm. You woke up and you thought, what? Um, I guess I, I look at this as uh, uh, just another step, right? Our, the, the, the semiconductor industry in general, it's Moore's law, the, the ability to make chips smaller and faster, it's getting expensive, it's taking longer. And, and you have to have scale to be able to do that. And you can see there have been transitions in this industry over the last 50 years where, where you know, th there was a step function in the cost of doing that, and there was consolidation that occurred. I think this is just another example of scale is important, you've got to have it, and there's consolidation. If so, you were Qualcomm, would you take the deal? I guess I'd always ask for more. That's what they're doing. I just think that's, a, that's always your first response, right? I'm, um, I'm worth more. What's the implication for you if the deal does happen? Um, I think, I think we face a constant uh, uh, kind of industry where the, the, the competitors are getting constantly bigger and stronger and you know, because of that consolidation. I, I don't think it really changes our strategy. This, uh, if you take a look at what they're doing and, and where they would play, uh, it's mostly not in the same places. We're in more of the higher end, high compute, you know, large data center, PCs, they tend not to be in those. So it's not going to change our strategy much. The other piece of recent news um, is you and AMD yeah. getting together. You have been trying to beat the brains out of AMD for years and years and years. I just wanted to even understand how this happened and why. You know, I, so we'll keep competing. Um, I, 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 in this industry, it's a very, you know, the technology it's, it's very different than, say, typical business. People look for how do you get a technical solution to the end user the, to fill a gap. In this case, we saw a high-end system where we needed a graphics capability that... that In, to compete against NVIDIA. To compete against NVIDIA, but not just to compete, but just to actually fill the customer. What, what does the customer want? What is, it, what is it required in order to meet those customer needs? So, so this is a case where competitors oftentimes will get together, work together, and, and then, you know, turn around tomorrow and we'll compete on the battlefield. Um, talking about competing on the battlefield, you compete against Qualcomm yeah. um, in many ways, but also on this phone. This is the new phone. This is a Verizon version, oh, okay. so I think it doesn't have your, your modem in it, oh. but the other version does. Yes, sir. Um, given the big fight that's taking place between Apple and Qualcomm, which is one of the reasons its stock price made to be depressed, which is one of the reasons Broadcom may have tried to buy it now. What do you, what do you make of that battle, that IP battle over intellectual property? Well, it's, it's, it's not a battle over the intellectual property per se, right? It's the licensing fees. It's, it's a battle about how do you get paid as, um, as a company uh, for the intellectual property you create. and and. We too believe that you should get paid for intellectual property that you create. You shouldn't necessarily get paid on a basis that says, whatever that product goes into, I'm going to take a piece of that total intellectual property. So I think the debate is really about how do you get paid for intellectual property and, and what percentage of a product do you, should you get paid for? You should absolutely get paid for. The, the product and the, and the, and the uh, intellectual property you bring, but, but the, the conflict is really, you know, do you get paid for everything that goes into that phone? So, so to cut through it, it sounds like you're with Apple. I'd say that we're more on the Apple side, yes, that you should get paid fairly for your intellectual property, but you shouldn't take a... And a, what do you do, by the way, and I think about this about Qualcomm, if you have this great customer, right, you've had this great relationship, and then they don't want to pay in the same way that they did before. Well, I mean, you face those kinds of, of 
you know, negotiations every day. Every, everybody in this room does. So nobody wants to pay what they paid yesterday for the products you deliver. They always want it, you know, in our world, they expect it to be cheaper and faster and smaller and more efficient. And, um, and so you have to deal with that. You have to bring, uh, you know, enough capability and, and um, uh, intellectual, new intellectual property that, that right. makes people want to pay, or you have to find a way to reduce your costs so that you can, you can charge a lower price. Yeah. Uh, broader policy question. There's a big question about manufacturing in America. Uh, you sure. were on the Manufacturers Council um, with President Trump. I, I want to talk to you about that in a moment. But uh, you are developing a plant, $9 billion plant. In Arizona. In Arizona. Yep. Um, Foxconn is coming to Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, what is possible? We, we always, you know, you hear all the time that, that, that maybe, you know, the historical version of manufacturing doesn't exist and will never exist in this country again. Well, I think if you go back to manufacturing of the, of, like you said, historical hand laborious type of manufacturing, um, yeah, I, I think that that is not going to come back to the U.S. If you, if you take a look at us, we have 70, roughly about 70, 75% of our manufacturing in the U.S. still. Yeah. It's highly automated, and labor is actually, you know, less than 30% of the total system cost. The rest of it is in the building, the equipment, all of that. So, so that kind of manufacturing, uh, now the only differential between where do you place that is things like tax, the, the tax system. Uh, currently, if we build a plant in the U.S. versus overseas, there's a, over a 10-year period, there's about a 10 or $2 billion additional cost to the company for having that factory in the U.S. versus overseas. And, and the majority of that is tax. So it's not labor. It's, it's, we can get the skilled labor. It's automated. It's about making a competitive tax environment. Okay, That's so why I was part of that, that committee. Um, let me ask you about the committee, and then I want to drill down on that one point you just made about changing the tax system, because we've had lots of people on the stage today with lots of different views about uh, the implications of that. Um, but you were one of the first people uh, to decide that you were going to step off of the Manufacturing Council. Yep. What happened? You know, I think it's never any one thing. You never just walk out and go, oh, it's this, you know, this thing that triggered it. It's, it's kind of a buildup. The, the, the first was, um, you know, I joined it to really be, to, I believe it's an imperative for the U.S. to, to keep men, bring manufacturing back. That R&D and manufacturing are often tied together. And if we lose manufacturing, I think we risk losing R&D next. And, and so I think it's an imperative. That's why I joined. Um, as we went through that week, uh, Charlottesville happened first, right? And yep. um, it made you start to think, OK, what's happening to this? And, um, and then Ken, what really triggered it for me was Ken left the council. And when Ken left, um, Ken Fraser of Merck. Yeah, Ken Fraser of Merck. When I saw him leave, and, and um, it became very politicized, rather than allowing him to have his own personal choice and his own personal. You mean the, the criticism on Twitter by the president of him? It was, on, it was the, uh, the criticism on Twitter. You saw it in a variety of. And I said, that's, that's not what I want to be a part of. This is not now. Uh, be, uh, something that's really focused on just manufacturing, it's becoming more political. And I'm not going to participate in something that is going to allow somebody like that to get bullied. Did you worry that if you stepped off, it was going to have an implication for either you personally or for the company? Yeah, I, I, I think you always worry about that a little bit. Um, but at the end, we get paid as a CEOs of these companies to do the right things. And, and at the end of the day, it was the right thing. And, and you have to think about your customers, your employees, and your own personal values when you make one of these decisions. And to me, all three of those lined up that this was the right decision. And, and so I. But the reason I ask is, is, you know, we just had this conversation with Randall Stevenson. There are questions about whether politics are playing a role in the regulatory environment for his company. You may be involved in all sorts of acquisitions in the future. How much of that plays into your thinking about either whether to have a relationship with the president or a party or not? So I think you have to engage with the government 
Um, and you have to engage the government wherever you're operating, right? Whether you're selling in that country or, or you have your headquarters in it, you, you have to engage with these governments um, because it's, it's critical for you to do business. So, so we continue to have a great relationship with the, the current administration. Um, you know, I, I, I think you, you have to continue to have those kinds of engagements. You mentioned taxes and suggested we needed to level the playing field and I imagine reform the tax code. Um, we've had a number of people here today who have uh, argued uh, Howard Schultz unapologetically suggesting that the corporate tax code corporate tax rate doesn't really need to come down, or maybe if it does, needs to come down marginally. Mark Cuban made a similar argument. I, What's yours on the other end? My argument was, is that, uh, you know, you have to look at the competitive nature. Companies, multinational companies, like all of us out here, can choose to put those factories in almost any country. and. Um, if we don't have a competitive tax system, then the, again, you know, why is manufacturing moving more and more offshore? If the rate came down to 20% or even 22 or 25, whatever it may, may end up uh, being, and I don't know uh, if you want to wager whether it's going to happen, um, but if it does, how would it change your plans? I think that every time we go to build another factory, we have to go through this decision-making process with our board and say, hey, you know, where are the options of putting this? And, and what are the relative costs to our shareholders? And can we offset those costs with other activities? So, you know, I think what will happen is you'll see more and more of our factories come back to the U.S. Uh, if the tax rate goes down. Do you have plans in place, ready to go, if in fact something, something were to take place? Well, we only build factories when capacity need, right? So, so right now I have space and I have the ability to expand in almost every one of my U.S. sites, uh, but I'll build when, when capacity is required. I uh, want to talk about the exciting part, I think, of your business, which is AI and artificial intelligence, yeah. and help us try to understand uh, where we are, what Intel is doing, uh, but also what Intel is doing relative to what everybody else is doing. I think we're all trying to understand how, what Google is doing, what you're doing, how you're doing it differently than Facebook, how uh, Facebook's uh, or, or DeepMinds at Google might be different than what Microsoft is doing. Wow, okay, that's a big question. Um, so maybe we should, should first talk about, you know, AI has come about, you can go back 50 years ago and people were talking about the ability to have artificial intelligence and, and all, and two things have kind of met together in the last few years that have allowed artificial intelligence to really begin to blossom. And I, and I say begin to blossom because it's really in its infancy. And, and that is the convergence of data. And as everything's becoming connected and you know, our lives are all now out there on, on, the, on the internet, the amount of data that's, uh, that's currently out there and that's coming is, is amazing. And as, Things like driverless cars come out, you know, the data is a thousand times more than what a human can create, right? So the machines will create even more data as they become connected. And then the amount of compute, the, the level of computing that we're able to produce in companies like Intel um, is now allowing us to take that data and actually build uh, understanding and decisions from that. So that, that, I think it's important first to see and understand where did artificial intelligence come out um, I think it's, it's just in its infancy. Um, right now, people are putting technologies that we have applied to artificial intelligence. Over the next three to five years, you're going to see technologies that are designed for artificial intelligence. So we, I'll give you an example. We just introduced something called neuromorphic computing. Uh, it's a computer that kind of works similar, more similar to your brain. I think of it as... Uh, thousands of small little processors that can operate independently at any point. It can visually learn without having to have somebody train it. It can sit and just watch you and it can identify what you are and what you're doing, um, what, what kind of motion that is. And it can, it can happen uh, hundreds of times faster than the current 
types of systems today. When you wake up in the morning and think about your competition when it comes to artificial intelligence, who is it? Well, um, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's almost everybody. I, I mean, it's, this is, a, again, like all technologies that are at, the, at their infancy, I think everybody's leaping in trying to, to make their ground. And everybody is both a partner, a customer, and a competitor at times. And so, um, you know, we sell a lot of silicon into a company like Google, but they're also competing with us to try and go even faster. It's, it's the great thing about the, the technology industry is that we all don't look at ourselves as competitors against each other, but more about competitors against the technology. Who can get to the best machine faster? Uh, one, of the, one of the big acquisitions you made that relates to AI is Mobileye. Yep. Um, and that's in part uh, the tools behind self-driving cars. What, what, what was that about for you? And how does that connect to all of this? Sure. So um, Mobileye, we, we, we spent years really understanding the autonomous car not just from the car, but really digging into what's required from a compute and technology level to really make a car drive and, and to do it in a very cost-effective, scalable way. And, and Mobileye has the best technology, both with the silicon, but also the algorithms, the, the, the software behind how you make the car drive. And it's, it's really a, a, a completely different model that says rather than, than um, be constantly looking at the world and trying to figure out what to do, you use a set of rules. And so it gets into a little bit about how you build artificial intelligence, but, but it's about building, we believe, um, the best uh, autonomous cars scalable at the lowest cost. Where are you relative to the other players? Uh, Dara from Uber was on earlier. Uh, he put himself in the top, what he called the top three uh, there was Waymo, I think him, and I think he was referring to GM, but maybe he was referring to you. Where, where do you think you, you are in all of that? Well, part, part of what you have to understand is that we're in almost all of those. Right. So, um, I mean, the great thing about Intel is that, that we make the silicon. We're, we're kind of the engine behind a lot of these devices. Um, we think technically uh, we're number one or two uh, as far as actually driving the technology behind that. Right. You're not going to see us, I mean, the difference between us and those people you named is they all build the car. You're going to build the brain. I'm going to build the brain and the eyes. They're, they're really two different things that our autonomous cars have. They have a set of computing capability that is a set of eyes that says this is what the world looks like. And then they have a set of computing capabilities that says, given how I see the world, here's how to get from point A to point B in a safe and... and, and okay, so here's the safety question. I think about this a lot. There are 33,000 uh, fatalities in America. In the US. In the U United States uh, every year due to vehicular uh, 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 problems. At what point, when does it become politically palatable that frankly someone may die as a function of the computer not doing what it's supposed to do as opposed to the human. Everybody here, when Oscar Munoz uh, had everybody raise their hand and said, how many people here would go on a autonomous plane and, and, and not- I would have raised my hand. I was raising my hand backstage. Um, We're working on that too. But what does the number have to come down to? Well, we just published a paper that said that we believe that autonomous cars can reduce the amount of deaths on the road by a factor of 1,000. That, that we're really talking about taking those 33,000 and bringing it to something less than 100. Uh, if we can push more of the autonomous cars onto the road. Um, those are the kind of numbers where I think, you know, it becomes easily um, a reasonable... Uh, and, and when do you expect that we're really going to see this in action? That, that, that seems to be the, the, the big billion or trillion dollar question right now. So uh, autonomous cars aren't going to be like, uh, you're not going to flip a switch and you're not going to go out tomorrow and go, hey, there's my autonomous car. I've been waiting for that to show up. It's going to be a continuum. You're going to see cars as early as next year that I, I talk about, you know, it's level three, which means you can kind of go from on-ramp to off-ramp uh, on the highway, and it'll drive itself. You can, 
You can maybe self-park. There, there are a lot of features. But, but you're not getting in the car and saying, take me to the office. Yeah, m most of us think that's around 2020, 2021. Um, that's, that's when you'll be able to truly be in the back seat and not have a safety driver and be in a, I'll call it kind of a random configuration. So, so in other words, I could, if I knew exactly the route you were gonna drive every day, I could go build you a car tomorrow that would drive you that route and drive you safely and you could sit in the back. But if I wanna have you be able to just pick your location you want to go to, it's, it's more towards the end of the decade. Uh, final question for me, and then I want to open it up to the audience. Uh, this is Jim Breyer. He said, the US and China are in an AI rivalry that is akin to the space race of the 50s. It is that, cri and the, uh, excuse me, it is akin to the space race of the 50s. The question that I have is, we keep talking about all these US companies as competitors. Where's China in all of this? And how much do you think about them? So I, I would have expanded that statement and say it's, it's the world, because it, as you go around the world, everybody is um, in a race on an artificial intelligence. Uh, China is quite good. Uh, companies like Alibaba and Tencent and Baidu, they're, they're quite capable and they have quite good technologists. And, and um, there's nothing, the US doesn't have a, they're, they're a unique position in this other than one thing, and that's the talent and I'll call it innovation culture that we have here. The, the, the technology, the ability to buy my silicon is just as available in China as in the US and Europe and, and everywhere else in the world. So, so it's about our innovation culture and it's about our talent. That's why you know this, this is so important when you think about the US in a big picture. But China along with many other parts of the world are, are, I'd say, just slightly behind us, but not far, uh, and it is a race. And, and it's, it's important for us to lead in this um, because it not only will give us you know, uh, advantages from a business perspective, but the societal changes, like things like autonomous cars or flying, autonomous flying uh, cars or whatever you want to talk about, are going to be led by artificial intelligence. And if we want to lead in those other industries, we, we've got to lead in this one as well. Let's uh, open it up for questions. Yeah, I'm a uh, tech, I don't want to call you a geek, but you know, maybe you'll have a tech question <laughs> in, the, in the center and then we'll go, we'll go, ooh, I see my friend back there. We'll go there. Uh, just to follow up on what Andrew asked, where would you say, uh, what percentage of cars will be autonomous, say 10 years from now, 15 years from now on the road, given that an average car is now 12 years old? How do you see this actually happening? Yeah, I, I think uh, when we talk about an average car of 12 years old, that's a very US-centric answer. I think if you go out to other parts of the world, th they have a much better, faster, higher turnover rate. Um, but I also think it'll happen much quicker than any of us think. Uh, if, you, if you look at what's happened just over the last two years, we've all gone from maybe it'll happen, looks like the technology is possible, to now we're having a discussion about is it 2019, 20, or 21 before the cars really start hitting the road? If you've ever ridden one, um, I, I've ridden many miles in, in autonomous cars now. Um, uh, I, I'll tell you, I took my wife in one, and uh, she, uh, I was like, look, this is gonna be a little nerve wracking. It's gonna look a little weird, you know, feel a little different. She got out of it and said, I'm ready. I never wanna drive again. So I, I think consistently, you talk to my children, my two daughters, They'll tell you, Dad, yeah, I, I don't need to drive. I'd be, I'd be much happier with an autonomous car, and I'm, I'm very okay with sharing that car with others. So I think it will happen. Society will make this transition fairly quickly um, once, the, once the technology becomes more available. I, so I think 10 years. I, I think in, in, in a lot of places like the you know, Silicon Valley, or New York, it'll happen very quickly, but overseas even quicker. You know, People like in China and other locations, they, they really are, are hungry for this technology. Okay. Gary Louder, the great Gary Louder in the back. Uh, you're very kind. Um, uh, earlier you commented on the uh, patent dispute between uh, Qualcomm and Apple. Uh, 
historically, Intel in the early in its life did rely very much on the patent system, but as the cost of wafer fabs for your type of CPUs has gotten into the tens of billions of dollars, there are very few people who can compete uh, with that, and therefore the need of Intel for IP has diminished. Um, to the extent that Intel is involved with lobbying the patent system, to be, uh, which affects everybody in all industries, um, to what extent do you think it's right to diminish the rights, the strength of patent holders for everybody, since you don't need them as much as you used to, but other people still do? Well, see, I disagree. We're we're one of the top ten patent creators in the in the country, uh, and pa importance of patents is as strong or stronger than it's ever been. Um, what we look for is. Uh, around patent reform, and in this discussion, it wasn't even about whether the company has the right to those patents or those patents are important or valuable. It was really how do you get paid for a patent, and should you get paid for the value you bring, or should you bring, you could, should you get paid for the value of the total product that's being produced, of which you're just one component? Uh, and our argument is you should absolutely get paid, and, and we've never, uh, you know, backed off from that, that you should absolutely get paid for the, what you bring, the patents, the intellectual property. Uh, the question is, should you get paid for much more than that? And we don't think that's fair. And who gets to decide? Well, ultimately, the courts and the government gets to decide. Um, and to some level, I'd argue then society gets to decide as well. Okay, let's uh, take a final question uh, right up there. Hold on just one sec. Let's try to get a mic if we can. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, is the quantum chip the future of your industry? And could you tell us about your quantum chip? Sure. Um, I'm glad you asked that. That was going to be my final. I thought it would be artificial intelligence and jobs, but that was, uh, uh, no, quantum computing, you know, one of the biggest things that people need to realize is that um, there's a broad spectrum of computing requirements from, you know, things out at the edge, smart cameras, and you know, drones that are flying around to the big data centers that are solving, you know, the world's biggest problems around climate and energy and, and all. And you need different types of computing to solve all of those. And you think about the data that comes into it uh, differently as well. Quantum computing is really good for a subset of, of, of problems. And those problems are not things like artificial intelligence, for example. They're things like large simulations, if you want to understand how drugs will impact uh, certain diseases, or you want to model uh, climates, you, they can handle much more data and see all solutions at, 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 a, at the same time and find which solution then kind of rises to the top and is the most common. Uh, think of it as it's almost like probability computing, that, that you just keep doing it a, a thousands and millions of times, and suddenly one answer just keeps coming up as the most probable. That's how a quantum system works. Um, we we uh, believe we are one of the leaders in quantum computing. There's, there's again, this is a race. Uh, we have a 17 qubit system. We'll get to 49. 49 is an important number because it, you get to what's called quantum supremacy. Quantum supremacy says that you've now built a computer that's more capable than anything else man's ever made. It's better, better than any traditional computer that's out there. Um, but it's still not really highly functional. We think you need to get to thousands and probably millions of qubits. Uh, and so we still think it's you know, 10 years. Uh, I think you'll see five to seven years research universities and, and governments We've built, we'll have built some for them. But before corporations have one, and it'll be the largest corporations who, you know, are trying to simulate or model, you know, oil, uh, you know, deposits and things like that, or, or you know, energy consumption in, in, in engines or whatever, uh, 10, 12, 15 years, uh, something like that. But it's an exciting area, a phenomenal research uh, area. Uh, and one that, I, again, it will change the world, but change the world in, a, in, a, in a, 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 a portion of the computing world. Brian Krasanich, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate it very, very much.